we have four compressors in parallel. We analyzed each one and we know what the tone of each one is and what the groove of each one is. And that's all interesting information to have. But now let's do a little subtractive analysis and find out when we've got a blend of all of these sounds, what happens when we take those qualities that we know the compressor brings away? Welcome to Kush After Hours. My name is Gregory Scott. Tonight's episode is gonna be a fun one. We're gonna dive deep into parallel compression on the drums. And when I say deep, I mean four compressors deep. We're gonna have four parallel pathways on a drum bus and find out what each of the four compressors is doing to the tone and the texture and also to the groove. And then once we get a little mix going of all these compressors, we're gonna start taking them away and figuring out what do we lose when we take these out of the mix. It's gonna be a fun exercise and we're gonna be digging deep. So buckle up, here we go. Okay, trying to make this an unmitigated disaster here and I will try not to ramble. Let's check out the music that we're gonna be working with. funk, baby. It's nice. These sounds are by and large on the raw side. So there's not a lot of processing happening. I got some plugins up, but each plugin is doing a very small amount of whatever. I'm just kind of feeling this song out at the moment here and setting up a bunch of parallel compressors and thought it might be interesting to share with you what I'm up to, what I'm thinking, why you might want to do this yourself. Play around with these for rhythm and texture. This is our musical turnaround. into the verse. Okay, so this is interesting. I've got four compressors working on the drums. You're only hearing one right now. But in terms of the music that you're hearing, let's just get clear on that really quickly here. We've got, let me turn off my solo safe, so I'll be using that for the demo. But for now, That's the music, that's it. And then we got some drums. Let's talk about what's happening on the drums on the recording side of things real quick. Let's move through the technical really quickly and get that out of the way so that we can get into the sounds. But it'd be good for you to understand what's happening in this session. Even though it's simple, there's some trickery. This is five microphones on a drum kit. This is a kick mic up close, snare mic up close on the snare, two overheads, old ribbon microphones, Cole's 4038s, love the sound of those things. And there's a hi-hat mic, which is a little unusual for me, but for the funk here, we need a little bit more control over the sizzle and the proximity of those hi-hats in the mix so that we can really control this groove. And that's an old KM84, it's a small diaphragm condenser, shoved up on the hi-hats, pointed at where my stick hits it. For the detail, so what's happening with the drums is we have these five microphones, four tracks, one of them is stereo, feeding bus one. Bus one is this creature over here. This is our drum bus. It's labeled drums, it's very simple. This is just an EQ bus for me. I have three EQs in series. We're not gonna get into what the EQs are doing. They're doing very little. Each one's doing small moves. I think the biggest move I've got going on in here is a three dB lift at hundred Hertz. Everything else is like one or two dB cuts here and there. It doesn't really matter. I got an imaging plugin, 0.82. So what this is doing, and this is basically the same as taking your left and right pan and pulling them in just a little bit. The drum bus is feeding another bus, bus seven. Bus seven, over here, you will notice all these creatures right here are bus seven. So the drum bus, five microphones into a drum bus, that drum bus is itself feeding four buses. What that means is that these four buses are working in parallel and I have a compressor on each bus. Each compressor is set to do a different amount and style and texture of compression. And we'll we're going to get really deep into why and what and all of that. But for now, it's good to know that just we have four compressors running in parallel off of one drum bus. They get progressively more aggressive. This is just so my brain has an easy time keeping track of the session. And this is what they sound like. Let me solo safe these three here so our music always stays in. And we're going to listen to the tight first. Tight is basically just the dry drums with 
little bit of coming like that. You might not even hear the difference with the bypass, and that's okay. So this I'm going to basically use as my dry drum bus. So when I want to blend more of an uncompressed, unprocessed sound in, this is what I will reach for. Now I have my punch compressor. It's very smacky. Smash. And crush. That's a long way. I'm gonna get into how I'm creating these sounds. I don't wanna spend too much time on that. And there's a whole process involved in mixing into these compressors to kind of get these things set up. I know what a lot of people love to do is they love to set their faders up on say the drum bus and they get their kick and their snare and, their... and then they put their compressor on and they play a lot with the threshold and they bring that down and they attempt to shape and control their compression that way and they'll go over to their output and change the output on the compressor and then add more of the threshold and then back off the output. You can do that. What I've done here, and I will do another video on this particular process, is I've mixed into these compressors. In other words, these compressors were all set up and then I went and I just chose one, sometimes I choose two, and I will mix my drum faders into the compression. I don't adjust the threshold on my compression at all. If I want more or less compression on everything, I'll grab all the faders and just pull all the drum faders down. It's a very different approach. I'll have the music going while I'm doing that, work the faders. That's all I'm gonna say on that for now, but I recommend you experiment with that. But for now, I wanna get into the parallel compressors here and what these things are doing for the groove and how and why you might wanna blend these different ways. So let's start off with our tight compression. This is subtle. I'm going to bypass this. I think a lot of you out there are probably going to struggle to listen and, and even hear what this compressor is doing. And that's okay because it's really not doing much of anything. It's just the subtlest stuff. But it's meaningful to me, eventually to be meaningful to you, but you don't really need to understand what this compressor is doing right now. Don't worry about it. Just know that we're gonna treat this like our dry bus. So if I want more or less of an uncompressed, untreated sound, even though it has some treatment on it, it doesn't really sound like it does, that's what I'll be blending into my drum mix. Moving on to the punch compression. This is the AR-1. I've pushed into this compressor pretty aggressively. The medium attack, five milliseconds and a medium release, 170 milliseconds. What that gives me, the medium attack, it lets a little bit more transient punch through. And the medium release gives me more of a punchy, tight, drier sound. So this for me is all about defining, especially the bottom end of the groove. We'll get back to that in a minute. Close this out. Let's move on to the smash compression. Novatron on Punish. That's a 20 to 1 limiter. Highly aggressive. And it's doing 4 to 6 dB of reduction. That's a pretty good amount, but look at my attack is all the way closed. This is 100 microseconds is what this is right here. And on the release side of things, it's 40 milliseconds. That's faster than your typical analog compressor can do. Um, there are some that do that, but most don't. And it's faster than most plug-in emulations will do as well. But what I'm really looking for here is just a, a smashing of the waveform, a flattening of it. Okay, we'll get into why in a minute. Just know that that's what's happening there. And then crush. That's a little on the crazy side. This is silica. I am grinding the input, but I have a really low blend on that, like 30%. So I'm getting a lot of distortion on this thing on the input, but I'm only blending a little bit of that distortion in. 
I'm in fury mode, which makes this compressor insanely fast. You can see if I just go to the gain reduction here, this needle is just, it's frenetic. And that's the sound that I hear of the compression. Got my side chain pushed a little higher than usual, up to 100 hertz. And again, I'm digging in like crazy with this compressor. Now, you'll notice it's only a two to one ratio, but because it's so fast and aggressive, because I have so much distortion happening in here, it creates a very energized sound. We'll get into why we want that in a minute. But so those are the four buses that I have in parallel on my drums, each one just a single compressor. Let's get into what these things do for the groove, and then we will start mixing them and figure out what's a cool way to manipulate the shape and sound of these drums with these four compressors. So I am now going to attempt to do something that might be a little strange to you. I'm going to attempt to show you with my hands what I hear each of these compressors doing to the groove how I hear or feel the groove in my body according to the dynamic manipulation that's been happening with these compressors. Starting off with the tight compressor, this should, in theory, feel pretty much the way it felt in the room, the way I played it as a drummer, because we're not really manipulating the dynamics in any meaningful way here. Just a little tonal tightening on this thing. how I hear it. That's the groove of the song. It's nice. Moving on to the punch compressor. Right, it's a very different feel. I really, really am focused on the way that spreads the snare out and just kind of softens. Because the transients are very soft here compared to punch, where they're very hard and knocky. We'll get into texture in a few minutes, but for now, move on to crush. This is all about the frenetic, visceral, high frequency, energized, kind of snappy, dancey part of the groove. This really gets the top end happening. It's frenetic. And that's a great energy to have. It's highly distorted, highly compressed. And moving on from groove, let's swing around to tone for a second here. Listen to the tone of these drums compared to our bass line sound. So bright. I mean, I think the peaks are actually louder on here with the transients. So bright, and these these move across the spectrum from this mellow dark through to varying shades of brightness. So you got a handle on what the groove is for each of these compressors. Let's, let's take a second to acknowledge the tone that they're bringing to the equation. So this is kind of how I record it. This is a natural sound. It's low midi, warm, soft, mellow. It's got some punch to it, but it's that unprocessed punch rather than the processed punch. The processed punch this is 
a hard sound. Knocky. It's skinny. Okay. This is wider and fatter in my ears. This really brings out the knock on the kick drum for me. High frequency, upper mid click. Smash. I love the way it brings out the snap and the brightness of the snare and spreads it a little bit more. So it's not such a fast, raw sound anymore. And we're getting some sparkle in the hi-hats now compared to this. This also gives me some spit. But here's an interesting observation about what Smash does. Smash to my ears takes the drum texture and tone and really marries it with the Chickawa. That sort of upper mid two to four K rake of the pick on the Chickawa guitar. almost the same sound when they hit. It's just the kind of thing my brain notes for future use, or not. Moving on to Crush. It's not just bright, I can really hear the stick hitting that hi-hat. I turn it down a little. This kind of turns the groove upside down, really. It takes it from this bottom, low mid, warm, pillowy thing. This also, to my ears, marries the envelope of the snare to that Chickawa. so nicely. So that's the textures that we're working with here and we've hit on the groove that all these compressors bring to the table. So what do you do with all these things, right? You've got these colors on your palette. As a painter, what I start doing is I just start painting. I just start pushing colors around and seeing what happens. So let's do that. Let's just start mixing our various flavors here. Pull these down all the way and just bring them up. One of the most fascinating things to me, which hopefully we'll discover through this little exercise here, is that, man, especially with transient rich sounds like the tight or the punch or really high frequency energized sounds like the hi-hats and crush or the snare and smash, just how little you need in a blend to make a meaningful difference. So what we'll do is we will build up a little mix it's not going to be the world's greatest mix. I'm going to be fast. It's just going to take a minute or two to do it. Instinctive. What I'm going to do is for each channel, I'm going to bring it up just to the threshold of audibility in the mix. Because what my engineer brain wants to hear is, okay, when this starts to poke through, where and how does it poke through? What does it give me? So if I'm doing a subtle blend and I need a little bit of just this right kind of a thing, I'll know what each of these things does at low volume. And then once I hear that, I'm going to push it to a reasonable kind of balanced affair. And then I'm going to keep going until it's very clearly overmixed. Because I also want to know as an engineer, what happens when this texture and this groove become a little overbearing? What does that do to the feeling or to the emotion? Because sometimes in a mix, in a moment of a song, in a section of a song, you kind of want to make something overbearing for a very specific reason, because it feels right, because it draws the listener in for fill in the blank, any number of reasons. I like having this information. I like knowing like, what does a little bit do? What does a lot do?
right. Start blending these things. So that's all I need to do there. I would move on as a mixer. So that was me mixing a little fast, coming up with a blend. Interesting, not where I thought things would land, but there we have it. So now we've got our four compressors in, in parallel. It's an interesting feel. What I want to do now is I want to play the mix as it is, and then take away one at a time each of these compressors so that we can hear what's lost right so we analyzed each one and we know what the tone of each one is and what the groove of each one is and that's all interesting information to have but now let's do a little subtractive analysis and find out when we've got a blend of all of these sounds what happens when we take those qualities that we know the compressor brings away what does it do what do we feel so it's, we're generally going to feel some sort of a loss at least we should if we feel a gain like oh that's better then our balances are, are a little wonky so, all good information. Let's find out what happens when we take each of these away, one at a time. And we'll start with the most high-frequency energized one, and also the quietest one. Let's see what happens. So what I hear happening here, this is very subtle. It's really just an energized hi-hat thing. I, these are so softly blended in. But it's really, there's a snap on the hi-hat that goes away, and I lose just a little bit of the crackling life of the song. It's not obtrusive, it's not obnoxious, but to me it's a meaningful difference because it's a little bit of that like pinging the third eye, like, hey, do you hear this sound? It's dancing away. Pay attention, but not too attention. I like it. It's just a little, it's brightness is what it is. It's a nice brightness. Smash. Ooh, feel that. I mean, that's most of the volume of the drums right there. So, for whatever reason, I chose Smash as sort of the dominant identity of this group. Punch. What happens? That's also a significant chunk of the volume of the sound, but really what it is, is it's the tone that's really changing for me. Clarity. I can, I can just feel that drummer hitting those drums. I actually want to back those off just a little. There we go. Mm. Nice. Tight. me this is about the roundness of the sound this kind of a thing happening Let's 
putting the drums up front. You could probably back it off a little bit. As a drummer, I tend to overmix my drums. I like it. So that's our parallel drum compression in a nutshell. We have four compressors in parallel being fed by the drum bus. Each of these compressors does a different amount and style and texture of compression, which in turn affects the groove. And then we blend those four to figure out what feels good, what gets the drums moving the way that you like, what gets them blended with other instruments or popping out the way that you want. All these options are available. None of this is intended to tell you how you should be doing things or even that you should be doing this. It's just you know, colors. I love colors. And this gives me very different colors and textures to play with. When I have an actual song fleshed out, I'm probably going to be moving these faders around for different sections so that as we get into that little lift there when the chord starts to modulate and we're lifting for the pre-chorus, I might push the crush channel a little bit to get a little bit more energy happening in the high frequencies and to just kind of like wake the listener up like, hey, 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 something's happening. And then in all likelihood, if I know me, I'm going to pull that back down, possibly way down, maybe even the hi-hat fader down as well, because I'm going to bring in a triangle, a shaker, tambourine, other high frequency stuff to help push the groove forward. And I'm going to need the drums to relax a little bit. Or maybe not. Maybe I'll leave it right where it is and just add those things in and just go farther. I don't really know. The point is, I have options, and I can push and pull these things. And just because I've set faders here, by no means is this that where they're going to stay. As the song unfolds and evolves from section to section, I'm going to be moving things around. I always do. So you got colors, which you can move around. You have textures and shapes of grooves that you can change the feeling. If there's a breakdown in this song, I might mute two of these out completely and just have the dry drums come in and push them, get a bit more of a dry thud happening in your face, lay the hi-hats back, have it be all about the backbeat. Man, so many options. Hopefully all of this was in some way useful and helpful to you. A lot of you out there are using virtual instruments. This is an amazing way, parallel compression and parallel distortions like this, an amazing way to take otherwise kind of vanilla or static or flat sounds and create a, mm, just shades, colors, variety on your palette that you can start painting with. Get to work. Thanks for hanging out with me. My name is Gregory Scott. This has been Kush After Hours. We'll see you soon.